buyouts that would generally allow someone under 18 to act as an adult does not apply to being an executor. The sort of thing I'm talking about is joining the armed forces, getting married, you are treated as having as being over 18 under those two circumstances. When it comes to administering a will, not. The person who's appointed as an executive needs to be willing to fulfill the role. Or they have to renounce that. If they are the sole executor, then they can either appoint somebody else, which will usually be someone like the public trustee's office, or the courts will appoint someone. All of those things increase the cost to the estate, so it's really useful. Have a chat to whoever it is you want to appoint the executor and see if they're prepared to do it. Can you renounce that appointment for whatever, for whatever reason? Yeah. After the yeah. And look, the most common one is don't. Look, well, the most common reason is don't have time. Okay. And we've run this. We've run this this uh, presentation for probably the last ten years now at various stages. And the reactions have been interesting. We've had sons telling their dads, "Sorry, I, really, you know, I run my own business. I really just do not have the time to do this. You know, I die. Don't have time." Or they're out of town. You know, the will's drawn up when they're working close by, where all the assets are, but they move from Brisbane to Melbourne. And they've got to try and administer the estate. The majority of which assets are based here in Brisbane, and it is being administered under Queensland law. I'll have that point just a moment. And they're based in Melbourne. It just doesn't work for them. Um, yes, another fun thing about administration of the states is all of the states and territories have different laws, rules, okay? which probably becomes more relevant with the bottom point here. If you don't have a will, you die, what's known as intestate, and you have a much larger document there. Why? Because it gets incredibly more complicated if you don't have a valid will. And I've said this in front of Scott before, so I know he doesn't get awfully offended by me saying it. If you die in test state, the only people who are going to make any money will be the lawyers. Yeah. Why? Because the whole thing has to go through the court process while they appoint administrators. Also, if you die in test state, and the document will give you an, eye, an insight into it, if you die in test state, your money will be distributed in terms of the law, not any random wishes that you may have. So, and they are strictly laid down. So. It may be that a third of your estate goes to your wife and two-thirds is distributed equally to your three children. When you want to leave the whole lot to your wife, well, that was your intention. I mentioned that it has to be a valid will. The sort of things to make your will invalid are if you get married. Divorce actually doesn't make the will invalid, but it does invalidate any bequests to your ex-wife. Okay, what are your duties? Your duties start actually on the date of death. Many of you will have stories where some bossy member of the family has come along and gone, oh, so and so wanted to have a big funeral with lots of flowers and the whole church pit and the whole thing. And actually, when you open up the will afterwards, you find out they actually know you want a quiet cremation with no fuss, no bother, and any flowers donated, the money donated to charity. As the executor, you are responsible organizing that, not some busybody member of the family. Almost certainly if the estate has any physical property, like a house, oops, the, the one, press that button, you will need to apply for probate. You can apply for probate yourself if you wish to, but it is fairly, uh, it is a fairly troublesome process. It is far easier to get a solicitor's help to do it. Give you an idea, public trustees who in the, uh, the documents I've given you are tout touting for business, they will charge you about three grand to get the program. Okay? Will be paid for by the estate, but they're taking their cut to manage the affair. I don't know what Scott, Scott charges, but I'm sure they have a lot less than that. Um, <laughs> Sorry, can we ask questions later? Yeah, go, no, go if, you, if you've got questions for us now. Probate, I sort of what is the trigger point to determine if a grant of private will be required? I've got no idea. Either do I. There is no 
Yep. Right. Yep. Generally, any any person who holds assets on the state, bank, building society, etc., like that, yeah. can, if they wish, require a grant of probate to be produced before they'll transfer those assets. You'll find various banks have different uh, cutoff levels. Yeah. Some will say 20,000, 30, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, look, if, so if there's only 20,000 in the account, they cut off 30, they'll say, we don't require a grant of probate. That doesn't mean somebody else can't ask for it. Oh, okay. So it quite often depends on the size of the estate or what's being transferred. Um, a lot of trust needs where someone um, uh, is the sole beneficiary will say that it, on, on death, we mm -hmm. require the trustee requires a grant of probate. Okay. For example, Macquarie, if you have a Macquarie cash management account, have more than about ten dollars in the account, they want probate. Because that's got a legal. It depends on what they want. It depends on 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 the person, on the bank. Yeah, yeah, and and they will vary. It depends on if they got sued last week on an issue. But if they did, they just went. There, there is no hard and fast cut. As I say, the general rule with physical property is involved, like a house, then then. Probate. What is probate? Probate is an application to the Supreme Court um, to <coughs> rule that you, the executor, are the person who has the right to manage the will. So you have a right to call in the estate's assets, you have an obligation to search for any outstanding debts or liabilities that the estate may have, and then deal with those according <coughs> to the and also that the document that you are purporting to be the person who's last one testament is in fact so. Oh, right. Now technically, once you've got probate, the only document as the, as, as the executive you need is actually the grant of probate. But I recommend that you get lots of copies of the probate and the will and everything else certified because everybody I know these days wants not only probate, How long does it take to get probate? Um, well, it, it, at the moment it varies depending on how busy the Supreme Court is. Um, the last one I did uh, a couple of weeks ago was three weeks. So it can take anywhere from two weeks to two months um, after the uh, solicitor or yourselves has finished drafting the documents and submitted them. Mm. But you have to advertise in the Courier Mail and the Queensland Law Why? Those are acceptable that you have taken adequate steps to seek the assets and the liabilities of the estate. It's a pretty onerous task. I mean, I suppose that's that's you need to pay a couple of dollars to get it to do the yeah. job. Yeah, you need to advertise and wait yeah. 14 days before you actually make the application. Mm -hmm. And then, even and then after that, once the great grant of probate is, is, is granted, mm -hmm. you still should wait a certain amount of time. That it's um, six months without notice, nine months for a claim to be made on the state before usually. I always advise that you do not distribute an estate uh, prior to six months from day of death. Okay, the executive is responsible for investing yeah, the assets. Six months. And you're responsible for investing the assets as a reasonable person. What does that mean? Hmm. Well, only know. the other siblings or the only the other heirs will actually call you to task. Because if you make the wrong decisions, it won't be reasonable. <laughs> it won't have been reasonable. Or well, they will do their damnedest to prove that it's not reasonable. I think when they answer you, it sounded very wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we, well, look, we don't know why. And paying all the debts. Now, some of the debts, some debts in an estate, um, actually die with the person. Not many of them, but one um, that is fairly topical at the moment is any hex or health debt. That actually dies with the person Debt. Sorry, did you say hex on health? Help. 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 It's the replacement of hex. Don't ask me what the new acronym stands for. What if the debt appears like two years down the track? Sorry? What if the debt appears two years down the track and it's all been divvied up? Who got to be responsible for that? If you, put, if, you, if you put your creditor's notice in the paper um, okay. and you specify you've got six weeks from the day of the notice but didn't put in, the, the estate can be distributed subject to any claims that happen for family provision on the estate. Once that's done and dusted, too bad. With one very noticeable exception, I'll be covering it in just a moment, but I'll address it now, and that is you, the executor, are liable for any tax payable by the estate. If 
you do not pay it, you are personally liable for the tax. Okay. That outstanding tax, Jeff? Well, any taxes well, outstanding? Or? Well, I'll, just, I'll cut it the whole mm -hmm. winding up just now. If I make it up. Can I just back you up on that, Jeff? Did you did I hear you right when you said hex? The hex debt is the only debt that dies with the debtor. It's an example of a, a debt. Oh, it it's a one others, example. It's, it's not the only one. Yeah, no, but, but no, your credit card debt's not going to die with it. Just <laughs> no, in case you think that. Spending Rats. spree just before you. Bang goes that all of them. Correct. Bang goes that all of them. But it, it, um, yeah, paying all debts includes, and remember, some of you will have heard me talking about this before, you know, reverse mortgages, you know, where the kids inherit mm -hmm. the house, and then all of a sudden when they're wrapping up the estate, they find that there's been this wonderful reverse mortgage that has been accumulating compound interest at 9% yeah. or whatever for the last 20 years, and the house is actually worth two tenths of not very much. Mm -hmm. So that has to be settled too. Then actually there, there, there is a point, finalise the estate tax, we'll come to that just now, distribute the estate. This is, the next point is really why there is the over 18 clause in there for being an executor. The executor has to be able to represent mm -hmm. the estate in court if necessary. So to do that, they have to be over 18 to be able to instruct the solicitor. And someone has to keep accurate records for seven years. I suggest you make sure your records are accurate, then you dump it on some friendly professional like your financial planner, your lawyer, your accountant. Personally, my choice would be the accountant. Thank you, Jim. He's not here, so I don't know what the hell. Okay, preparing for executive. Okay, so if you are going to be, you have been asked to be the executor, so first of all, agree that you're going to. What if you haven't? What if you haven't? Find out on the day. That you're an executor under, under the law. Quite often happens, and yeah, it's just one of those things. Um, and many people don't disclose or don't oh. discuss their, their, their wishes with other people. I think I'm going to have a personal experience. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but just how do you raise the executive suburb with a stepmother who's been, you know, it's been seen that you've been simply too inquisitive into her affairs? You were asked to do that. Ask them years ago. You were asked years ago, we weren't told, and now that she's made. Since I don't know whether you're the executor on the current will. But you can't, you've got to be blunt about it. Uh, the, not when I saw it today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, look, um, the, none of these conversations around death yeah. are particularly pleasant. And I'll talk about some personal experiences yeah. as we go through why, because it's easier if I tell you about myself rather than try and make up um, other examples. Yeah, agree to be the executor, talk to people about it. Really, it's communication, because if, if you just dump being the executor on somebody, and there are some unpleasant clauses in your will, it's not very nice to the poor bastard that you just let it be on you. No, you've dumped it up, really. You know, and the sort of thing I'm talking about, we have clients where, and they're, they're sort of one of the top end clients in terms of their, their actual wealth. Um, one of their grandchildren they lent money to to buy a car some years ago. And now every time grandpa mentions the money to the kid, the kid runs 100 miles. Yeah. He has excluded this child from his will, very specifically. And he has said that the little bugger is not getting any money because I lent him some and now he won't even talk to me about it. And the executor has explained this. And the executor has now got to front up to the kid and the kid's parents to explain why the kids get nothing when all the other five or six grandchildren are getting quite a lot of money. So. This really comes to the second point. Talk to the will maker. What are they trying to achieve? And will they put a letter of wishes together? What's a letter of wishes? Basically, it's an explanation of it. If you've got any dodgy clauses in, in the will, why are you put them there? Really, because, as I say, it's not very nice to give somebody the will. Oh, no, it's a problem with the will. No. And they open it up, and you know, they, they get blasted double barrel shotgun from somebody because they're not or they end up spending huge amounts of time in the courts while the courts decide because an action has been taken because someone's been excluded from the will. And if you are going to, the, the letter of wishes, by the way, has absolutely no legal standing. Mm. It is just an explanation to help both the solicitor and your executor know what's going on and why. And the courts may take it into consideration when they are determining any settlement. 
They encourage the lawmaker to talk to beneficiaries about the structuring, personal experience. Um, I, like many professionals, own virtually nothing. Okay, asset protection, so that if anybody chooses to sue me, in case you're worried, yes, I do have professional indemnity insurance, so you can have a go at that if you wish to. But if you want to come after my personal assets, I don't own very much. Alfred died maybe three years ago. Before, when he came down about six years ago, I talked to him about this and I said, look, please, anything you leave me, do not leave to me in my personal capacity. I have a family trust there for asset protection. Please, will you leave anything you are leaving me to go into the trust? Because I don't want it in my name. Yes, 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 you can do it. Yep, yep. I checked with him the time he came down subsequently. Have you done this? Yep, done it. Reshaped it, been done as well. Good stuff. Unfortunately, when he died three years later, we opened up the will. Our sister was uh, the executor, and guess what? It's all to me. Whatever was left to me was in my personal name. So now I have these assets in my name, but I don't particularly want. There will be the same for other professionals. I know very, very few professionals who have assets mm -hmm. in their own name. Professionals, lawyers, accountants, doctors, mm -hmm. you name it, most of us have asset protection structures in place, and that is where they would like anything you're leaving them to go. Otherwise, they may have to spend a lot of money getting rid of those assets and putting them into the protective structure. Classic example is a piece of property. Okay, When we first moved up to Queensland, I was employed by someone else. There was absolutely no possibility I was going to be sued. So my wife and I bought our house, joined names. I then went out on my own, put in place the asset protection structures, don't want the house in my name, had to shift my half into her name. So having paid all the stamp duty on the purchase, I then had to pay half of it again to get rid of it, put it in her name. Now there are discounts because it was loving something. Yeah, like that. But it, was, it still cost me about five grand to get rid of the house. Put it in her name. If you do that to one of your kids or one of your heirs, they will have the same feeling of love and affection for you. But, you know, yeah, thanks, thanks, but it's going to cost me five grand to get rid of it. Um, yeah, this is actually an interesting one. Get a copy of the will or at least know where you're going to find it. Make sure that your executors know where your will is. And make sure that they know that it is the last copy. Mm -hmm. That you know, you may have a copy of your stepmother-in-law previous no. version. No. No, you haven't. Yeah, no. you haven't even got a copy of the old one, let alone a new one. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that when you stand up before you, you know, you put all the documentation together with probate, you're fairly confident that what you've got is actually the last, the last will. What's the difference between a will and a testament? A will and testament, but obviously different. What's the testament as a the will? That's just the old terminology. Um, there's no, some people just bought the last will of, and a lot of people bought the last will and testament of. It's just a, a, a keep open from old times. Um, a lot of precedents you'll find, law firms will just use the same thing over and over again because that's what the courts are used to seeing. If the courts are used to seeing it, the chances of things going wrong uh, are less. And so we don't, we, we don't like change too much. And so yeah. if they're used to seeing last will and testament, then we draft last will and testament. Some people, we want to be a little bit more exciting, they'll drop the Latin and Testament part, just put this as the last will of, and most times they go through just fine. Mm -hmm. But the idea is to give it in a format to the court that doesn't ra raise any suspicion. And that way you get through probate a lot, lot, a lot easier without requisition. Mm -hmm. So it's just a carry over from old, yeah, old it's times. Not it's not like the old days, it used to be give, give devise, and bequeath, and we need yeah, to say, I give. Yeah. Yeah. So well, why can't you get to a video? Of well, yeah. well, there, there, there actually have, has been cases comments. where people have taken, uh, they've written things on their iPhone. Yeah. A will to be valid has to be a document. Mm -hmm. And so the court tries to read a very, very wide interpretation of what a document is. And so it might be um, that there has been a DVD case where it was considered to be a document. So in order for that valid will, it must be reduced to a document. It has to be witnessed, in theory, by two people. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting carve-outs I read when sort of catching up on whatever the current law is, is that they cannot be visually impaired, the witnesses. Mm -hmm. They cannot be visually impaired, because mm -hmm. they have to 
see you signing the document. Is that what you're talking about, Mr. Jeff Bradley? It's a very thankless role, isn't it? You don't get any thanks for that. You don't get paid for it. I was going to say, we'll come to that in just a moment. I think we'll come to that. It's in there somewhere. I don't think I've said it over there, otherwise, someone would have brought it to my attention. Okay. Yeah. And this prison isn't just a town for business, by the way. We get involved in just about every estate because we are, we, apart from knowing pretty well a lot of you and you know, what your wishes are as far as, oh, my son's ever wanted this much or doing this and that, we usually the ones that end up selling the assets or giving advice on investing the assets or giving you advice on what to do with the assets, how best to crystallize it. And the thing to bear in mind is when you're doing a distribution, if you are the executor and you're doing a distribution, $100,000 of cash and $100,000 of CBA shares are not the same thing. No. Okay, because the $100,000 of CBA shares will almost certainly have huge amounts of capital gains wrapped up in them that someone is going to call at some point. So we, we do an awful lot of work trying to balance estates when there are assets that people actually don't want to sell and turn into cash. Um, okay, a few arrangements. Yeah, current costs. There are certain priority debts, and funnily enough, paying for the funerals is one of them. So it comes right up there as top of the list of spending any money from the estate. So if there's only 10 grand in the estate, it's going to go to the funeral director. Because even a cheapy will, a cheapy funeral these days, you know, coffin, cremation, memorial chapel in one of the gardens, is going to cost you about 10. Okay, determine if probate isn't needed, that's where you take professional advice from the solicitor. Now, most solicitors do have a trust account, but a lot of them these days do prefer there to be an estate bank account, which you will only get, uh, or banks will only allow you to uh, open if you have got probate, because it proves that you have the right to gather in the assets of the estate, and open up the account, and, and so on. Okay, important to understand the nature of the assets and the liabilities. Because if one of the assets and the liabilities is a fruit shop, anybody want to visit a fruit shop that's been locked up in Brisbane summer for two weeks while you visit and sort out what's going on? I would suggest a hazmat suit is probably an appropriate thing to wear at that stage because you are not going to enjoy the experience. Whereas if you understand that that is one of the assets that you are responsible for managing, you get in there quickly, get the stuff out, and so on. Um, similarly, if uh, there is property or rental property, you are responsible for making sure that that property stays safe. So you're responsible for making sure that it's locked up, you're responsible for making sure it stays insured. But uh, you know, all security precautions maintained, that the garden is maintained, so it's not a please burgle me sign in the neighbourhood. So those, all those things fall back on to you. Know who the beneficiaries are. Great Aunt Sally, who lives in Whoop Whoop, may be really well known to the testator. Your executor, who is your son, your daughter, your cousins, may not know who the hell Great Aunt Sally is. And may have absolutely no idea where to find her. Because the last time you saw her was at the, that wedding about 25 years ago, but you knew she was a bit hard up there, so you decided to flick her 20, 20 grand from her estate. Okay. Wasting asset that comes back to the fruit shop that I was talking about. Okay. What are estate assets? Because a lot of people, uh, when especially when we talk to them, don't actually understand what they own and what is owned by some other legal entity that they manage or are responsible for. An insurance policy may form part of your estate, or it may not. It depends on the beneficiary nomination on your life insurance policy. If you have nominated a beneficiary on your life insurance policy, or for a policy that is more than about 15 years old, the owner of that policy may mean that the money bypasses the estate. Do you understand what I mean? Okay. Personal example again. 20 years ago we came to Australia. First thing we did was take out the insurance policy on my life. At that stage, beneficiary nominations were not allowed on life insurance policies here in Australia, so my wife had to own that policy. 
I die, the proceeds of their policy will be paid straight to her. It will not go into my estate. It will not be up to my executor to distribute those. That money will not form any offset against any liabilities that I may have in my estate. Yeah? Yeah, secure the assets, so that comes back to making sure it's insured, making sure it's invested properly. Any liabilities? I mentioned the reverse mortgage, but any other house where there's a mortgage. If there is a mortgage against the house, the bank has first call on proceeds from the sale of that house or from other proceeds that are in the estate. You know, Hollywood makes movies in themes and trends. Well, it seems to be that way in financial planning too. Twice in the last month I've had clients who have pieces of property that make absolutely no financial sense for them to hold on to because they're not providing them with any sort of return at all, especially when you take into account the debt that they have against them. But their children are saying, you must keep this piece of property because in one case it was granddad built it and we want, you know, we want to move in there. Well, parents of church, poorest church mice because the house is not making any money whatsoever. And when the debt's paid, frankly, the house isn't going to be worth a whole lot anyway. Because they've cleared out most of the assets and the rest of the estate, and they're just going to have this house. Three children. None of them live anywhere near the house. It's a lot of their home. How well do you think that's going to go down in terms of it? But that's the situation at the moment. The bank has first call on the other assets in the estate to pay the debt against that house or the key house. Priority debts. I mentioned funeral. Um, he gets paid too. The solicitor gets paid. Oh, yeah. <laughs> as, as a priority debt, you know, if you want to know who the lawmakers are, I'll give you some guesses. Okay, I don't. You know, I'm down at the bottom of the, 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 of the pond as far as um, getting paid any, any debts from the estate debts. Okay, who are the beneficiaries? I mentioned you know Great Aunt Sally, but it's important to make sure that if you're drawing up the will, that the will does take account of someone predeceasing, someone who was mentioned in your will predeceasing. So it doesn't just say, oh, I leave all of my money to the child. It's, are there any children from the children in case your child is Interest notification, charities especially, okay? As an executor, yes, you can tell people that they're mentioned in the world, charities, as soon as you tell the charities, expect your phone to ring. Very regularly, very frequently, and very annoyingly, because they like to get their money as soon as possible. Minors, how are you gonna handle them, okay? I'm I have a 16 year old. <laughs> Me or him? <laughs> that, that would be a debate at the moment as to who's getting worse into that particular deal. Right? Um, yeah, who's going to look after him? Okay, because just because you're the executive doesn't make you the necessarily the guardian, which, for which you may thank God. Okay, again, another dirty trick from my client files without giving anybody away. Um, and they're both their sisters, they've both been clients for a very long time. The elder sister gets married, has first baby. The younger sister is busy having a real good time in London, has an MBA from Cambridge, is working for an consult international consultancy, doesn't spend two nights in the same place. Mm. Guess who elder sister mm. has appointed as guardian for her <laughs> newborn baby? <laughs> <laughs> Just going to see a lot of the world. When I challenged them on the wisdom of this appointment and asked if they had bothered asking the younger sister, I said, do you think we ought to? Oh. Bloody right. <laughs> okay, because apart from the fact that she's going to have to throw in a job and come back to Brisbane to look after the baby, and you know, just didn't bear thinking about it. So, you know, be kind. Think about who the, who the hell it is you're involving in all of this process. Because while she might be prepared to spend a couple of weeks being executive of the estate, being guardian of, 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 of brand spanking new baby was really not right up there in terms of her, her oh, priorities. Love that. 
Okay. <laughs> I'm sure there was a movie about that. Somebody yeah, there, there is actually. I forget. Yeah. It but it happens child. in real life. I mean, a teenager. No, that's, this is not from the movie. I can tell you the name of the client. I'm not going to. Anyway. Okay. Testamentary trust. Again, just because you're the executor does not mean you're the trustee of a testamentary trust. Sorry, let me step back. Testamentary trust, a trust that comes into existence because you are now dead and you have instructed for this trust to be created on your death, into which, hopefully, you have made provision for certain assets to be dumped, to be then distributed onwards to some named beneficiaries. And you will agree with your legal representative the terms of that trust. Make sure you appoint an executive, uh, sorry, uh, trustees for this trust, because otherwise the executive will end up almost by default being the trustee, which he may not want, especially if the plan is that this trust is going to carry on in existence for the next 25, 30, 40, 50 years. Those themes that I was talking about, we now have, just recently I've been working with two families who have severely disabled children. Someone is going to have to look after those severely disabled. tell you now, in one case, none of the three siblings, and in the other case, two siblings, want to borrow it. So, someone has to, funding, structure, management, all need to be taken into consideration. back, I think, Rob, to your, your question. It is the trustee, uh, sorry, the executive's responsibility for making sure that tax returns are submitted on behalf of the deceased and the estate. For however many tax years are involved for the estate. Okay? So, we're sitting here, it's the 30th of April. I dropped dead today. I will have a personal tax return that will need to be done from 1st of July 2014 to 30th of April 2015. My estate will have a tax return to do from 1st of May 2015 to 30th of June, and then onwards into the next tax year until the estate is finalised. Okay? Remember, making it back to one of the earlier slides, I said, buddy up. To the professionals that your testator or the testator uses, but uses an accountant making your best friend for those tax returns. Because there are almost certainly no liabilities that may have or sorry, losses that may have been carried forward that can be offset against taxes. I mean it's got big on losses. Yep. Um, I'm just thinking here, all this work that's involved here, surely you get this person doing it will that need some sort of um, monetary value for, for the person doing it. That sounds like a lot of work to me. That's why I say you use the professions. Okay, you can do it all yourself. Yeah. Oh, I like to do it, mate. This was easy. Yeah, man. <laughs> it's provision for yeah. for executive's commission, Mike. Is that what they call it? Right? Yeah, executive's commission. Yeah. I, think, I think it's on the next slide. Oh, okay. Losses. Yes. This was, this was a, one of my aha moments, again, when doing, doing some work uh, on this presentation. It, and it's a it's, it's change of, of rules, which not many people know about, I found, because I've asked. <laughs> Funnily enough, because as I say, it was an aha moment for me. It used to be that if you were carrying forward a capital loss in your personal tax return, as many of us are for the global financial crisis, that you could carry that loss into the estate. Part of the work we would then do on behalf of the executor would be to soak up that loss by selling assets at a capital gain, re-establishing a new cost base if those assets would be repurchased, so that new assets were distributed with a new cost base onwards to the heirs. What's the rule change? The rule change is the loss dies with the taxpayer. We have been doing quite a lot of work with some of our older clients who are concerned about the losses that they're carrying forward to restructure their estates or restructure their investments so that those losses are absorbed now. New cost base are established and onwards from there. But for some people that can be quite a substantial amount of, of, of money, especially
especially global financial crisis. Now, I must have skipped, skipped past the slide on, on commissions, um, and, it, and it is very real. Normally, an executor's role will be unpaid, but it is very possible for you to allow for executor's commissions to be built into your estate. And if you have a fairly large, complicated estate, I suggest that you do, um, because it can be a lot of work and it can be time absor absorbing for your executor, um, even if they are making use of all the professional support that you're, you've got. Um, but it does need mean a redrafting of your will to allow it. Because otherwise you get, you've got to get uh, agreement from all of the uh, except all of the heirs that, uh, you know, that you're basically taking money from. And they may decide no, we're not going to give it to you. Okay. Um, your liabilities. Interest on any legacies from the first from the first anniversary. Basically, if you take more than a year to wrap up the estate, you could be liable for interest on the legacies. Now, hopefully, if you're going back to the reasonable person investing the money, that's got you covered. But depending on the other buggers who are in the world, not necessarily. Um, Yeah, we have encouraged most of, the, most of you present to re revisit your wills recently, and preferably provide us with copy of and, and we can make sure that you've revisited it. One of the things that I haven't covered previously in wills is if you've made specific bequests in your will, they get paid first. Immediately following the global financial crisis, there were some very sad cases of people who took significant hits in 2008, early nine, and when their estates got worked through by their executors, the bequests cleaned them out, which meant there was nothing left as a residual in the estate to be paid on and it's usually you know, a specific bequest to Battersea Dogs Home or to the RSPCA or things like that. And they go first. And it's the residual that then gets distributed between my three children. And the kids end up with Nick's. So please check that your will does actually cover the bequests plus any fees that you want to pay. And so on. I mentioned you're responsible for any taxes. If, sadly, at the end of the day, you get around to it and there's absolutely nothing left in the estate, well, it doesn't matter that you're leaving the residual to the people because there's no need to give. Um, but you, your executor is the one that's actually going to be the one that ends up breaking out sad news to people who thought they were going to inherit. Which is why, going back to um, reverse mortgages, why the banks require your children to actually sign the paperwork that they know about reverse mortgage. Is that good? Sorry? Is that the old enough in reverse mortgage? No. no it, it was good. only when the kids started getting, <laughs> <laughs> getting <laughs> fed up with the fact that that house that they thought was worth a million bucks that they were going to inherit belongs to Westpac. Yeah, belongs to Westpac or Bar, or this very thin veneer over the top that was all that was left of the inherent value of it. So, yeah, they have, now, now if you want to take out the reverse mortgage, you have to get signed off by three people. You have to get signed off by your lawyer, financial planner or accountant, and your children. <laughs> okay, getting to the end, please don't be afraid to ask for help. Come talk to us first if you want. We, uh, it, sadly, we have an aging client base. Um, very often involved very early in the piece as far as I say management goes. Uh, and we are here to help. That is a sad part of our role. We're here to handle any insurance claims. You know, don't tell your executives that they don't need to fight with the insurance companies. They talk to us, that's our job, that's what you've been paying us for for years. Um, you know, Sandra, Tristan, Elliot, notice I don't include myself in the list. 
know exactly who they're going to be dealing with and how to get the money out as quickly as possible. Um, the solicitors will guide you through the whole probate process if that's necessary and give you advice on it. Um, and the accounting. So they will help you with, we help with the investments and, and what should be cashed up. Uh, and that is the mm -hmm. end, except for the disclaimer that said basically the status of the one at the beginning. Exactly. You, you really personally let you are, aren't you? It's sort of like for some whatever reason that the delay and this time like getting a certain time frame or that. I mean, that's I guess I do. Yeah. Well, you've got you've got to act reasonably in everything you do. Yeah. Uh, usually, once you find out, if you find out in two days' time that, that you're the executor of someone's will, the first thing you do is secure all the assets they've got, lock up the house, and things like that. And then obviously the, the, the first thing you need to look at is the um, is, is the is the, the, the funeral arrangements and things like that. Get a hold of the will. Sometimes there's um, information there on on burial information. Sometimes people don't want that included in there. So it's always good to have a bit of a look at because as Jeff said before, um, if, if you don't look at the will for a couple of weeks time and, and all of a sudden you've had this green, um, it, it may not be covered or you may not be entitled to be reimbursed out of the estate for the expenses that were put to the estate unnecessarily or not in accordance with the will. Right, you in the pocket. Considering you're other people, I think you need to think about it. I mean, I, I can only encourage you to talk to uh, the older generation, the next generation as appropriate, um, so that you're prepared. Again, use a personal story. My in-laws live on the Isle of Man. We know where the Isle of Man is, just where the Isle of Ireland, northwest England. Three loops. Sorry? It's three loops. Yes. <laughs> they came down, I forced a conversation which made my mother in law incredibly uncomfortable because she didn't want to have a conversation about what was going to happen if one of them died. My father in law uh, was my mother in law's second husband, my wife's stepfather, but he was the only father in law I'd known. So he was my children's grandfather, grandfather, so I was quite happy that if something happened to my mother-in-law, he could come with us if that's what he chose. Similarly, if he died, she could come with us. Their choice. But we need, I wanted to know, because frankly our house is not, is not going to be, have a nice granny flat put in the back garden. We don't have the space. Or we have the space, but it would be pretty uncomfortable. On. I think the swimming pool it looks better where it is. Um, <laughs> as I said, I forced the conversation because I wanted to know. I wanted to know if something happened to one of them. That uh, basically my wife and I had to fly across there and sort it, get the problem sorted out, pack up the house, move the whole bit. So my mother-in-law didn't want to have the conversation. Fortunately, my father-in-law recognised that they needed to have that conversation. They needed to sit down and have the conversation, which they did. And they let us know that no, if anything happened to either of them, the survivor was going to stay on the Isle of Man carry on. Okay. Big relief, we all knew what was going on because my father-in-law never came back. After he went back to the in England, he had to have open heart surgery, he didn't get off the table. Mm -hmm. So literally within about three months of initiating that conversation, it had the outcome was used. I encourage you, if you've got executors or children who live out of town, what is expected? What's going to happen? Don't just think it's it's at that level either, and it's a bit of a side issue. Mediterranean families, they're still culturally, the older generation think they're going to come live. <laughs> the younger generation, guess what? The younger generation doesn't think that at all. <laughs> I have had to referee a couple of Barneys, intergenerational Barneys, where, and it tends to, sorry, this is not deliberately sexist, this is just a statement of fact, it tends to be the mother. <laughs> okay, and it tend, who, who is determined that eldest son especially is going to look after us in our dotage, and it is the wife who isn't, who just, she's not coming in my bloody kitchen. No way. Oh, I see, we've had this conversation. <laughs> 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 Oops, Laura, sorry. No, okay. get in first. <laughs> get in first. You don't want them to okay. make them live. Talk about it. it. They're not nice conversations to have, but look, I've been in life insurance. I've had these unpleasant <laughs> conversations with people about dying for going for 40 years now. They're not nice conversations, but they really are absolutely necessary to have. 
You wouldn't like it if it happened to you. Dump, don't dump it on your executive. Let them know what the hell they're in for. Please. You know, we'll help. Scott will help, or whoever your nor other solicitor is. If you've got another solicitor, mm -hmm. they will help. Your accountant will help. Um, but the you know, best thing is let your executive know. That if they are your executor, let them know what the will says so that they can ask you any questions. So they can go, oh no, well, I was talking to mum about this, and this is what we should write down. Have I covered everything? Is that yeah, it's hard. Sort of writing it down a little bit. This okay. talk now, I think, sure, four, 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 fifth questions. Time. Anybody got any questions? I do. Yeah. I have a question. Um, at the moment, our wills uh, just involve both of us. So I'm the executor if needed for my husband and he's the executor if needed for me. If in retirement we seem to spend a lot of time together and there is the opportunity or chance yeah. That perhaps both of us might pop off at the same time. Car accident, spring so red lead Exactly, mine. exactly. Yeah. So, should we have some other sort of clause yeah. built into our into our will now? To, and we only have one child, so there's not going to be any Barneys. Um, but should there be you another? Can appoint, you can appoint somebody else as an, alter an alternative. So, if if if. Um, each to each other at first instance, and if one of, if one of your predecessors, then you can appoint somebody else as an alternative. Um, it would, if both of you happen to go in a car accident, the person who is older is then um, to go first, and the person that's younger is then to survive by one day. So, that if, so if, 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 if the male's older than the female, the estate of the, 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 the male goes to the state of the female, the state of the female goes by her will, so presumably beyond to the children or child after that. So if there was no one in the hierarchy higher than your child, which I couldn't imagine there being, your child would be the person that would be entitled to apply for letters of administration with the will attached to administer your estate. And Robin, from what I know of your family, that's pretty straightforward in your case. But with the modern family, be careful. Mm. So what Scott said about the order of dying. Absolutely. So look, everything goes from husband, to wife. The wife has children from previous marriage. Mm. So money for her will makes provision for those three children as well. So money from hubby, who mm. was designed to go to just their two children, mm. now fortunately gets diverted through her will to the three kids from the previous marriage. Uh, if you both go to the same car accident, but I am not the one today, before I get you check in. Is there a kind of point where well, the, 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 the legal position is, is unless you change it in your in your will, the legal position is in order to take from a, a, a distribution from an estate, you need to survive by 30 days. 30 days. Okay. So if your will is doesn't exclude the previous situation, you've got husband's wife, wife's deemed to have survived by one day, but because they haven't survived by 30 days, the wife actually predeceases. And so, um, as you can see, we're getting into a, 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 a calamity there. So, yeah. <laughs> take personal advice. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. it would be, I'm just curious. If the wife was predeceased, so that means that the wife's estate goes to the husband, and the husband's will then gets get his what's used to distribute the estate. So, yeah. but you can ask for you can most things that you want that are in the law, you can have them changed by specific provision in your will. Mm -hmm. So you can ask that you, you have a draft you will to say that I've been advised that the general position is that a person has to survive me by 30 days, but for the purposes of my will, I don't wish that to apply. And so the person's only got to technically survive me by one second, or a split second even, I suppose, if you really want to quibble about it. Or well, even though, it's going to be a little faster. It, it depends on, well, you can, you can modify it. If you say, I would, um, no one takes a, uh, a gift from my, from my will and they have survived me by 60 days, you are free to modify it. So in which case, if I can just go back to the executor story again then, um, if my will appoints my husband as my executor and his will appoints me as his executor, yes. where does the executor come from if both of us go at the same time? That's or, where is that what that letter of... Letters of administration. Letters of administration with from... The, with the will attached. Yeah, the court. From, from the court. Oh. See, Which they're going to hate back, this, aren't they? Comes they back to what I was saying about more work. Yes. Yeah. 
I mean, it's, it's not meant to be sort of scary. It's just that there's, there's things you can put. Most most people, most people, most ones that I do generally, the case will be if there's children around there. It's they point each other unless unless the other is of the mind that they don't think they could deal with it because of emotions or what have you, or they're just not savvy with paperwork and things like that. Then quite often, sometimes a husband will not appoint a wife, or a wife will not appoint a husband. They'll just simply point their children mm. um, or the survivor of them. So it's a matter for yourselves. But quite often, it's a good idea if you go to appoint your husband or wife that you have someone also in there as a backup mm. who maybe um, some years younger. So the opportunity <laughs> for there to be at least someone in there mm. to avoid the, the need to go for letters of administration. Mm. It's not a difficult process, but it just might add a little bit of extra cost because you've got to clear off all the people who might have a prior right to apply. I guess you could talk to someone like yourself uh, just, just to, to try and mitigate any of these challenges that, that could be made against the will. Yeah, it's so it seems more daunting than what it really yeah, is. Yeah. So most people, most people, if, if you say, oh, I appoint my wife or, or husband, either way, I'll just use whatever. I appoint my wife as my executive. If my wife predeceases me, then I appoint my mm -hmm. two children, John and Jim, or the survivor of them, and the chances of all of them going same time is, is quite remote. So, um, especially when you've got adult children, uh, the, the common calamity doesn't pop up that often. Mm -hmm. So, um, what yeah. children are permanent residents overseas and have companies to go over there and have all their assets in companies out there and best place in the company, like Maryland or some of those? Mm -hmm. Does that cause problems? Does that cause issues? Sorry, if you have Curb, 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 if you does that make our wills more tricky from the point of view that we need to look at revisiting our wills? Does that make it tricky from the point of view that if we're living, if we're living, like you were talking about leaving something to him, but we need, we probably need to ask him when we're doing our wills what he wants us to do. Well, if it's if it's if it's like if it's going to be a house, you can't take the house overseas with you. No, no. So it's it's one of so if if you so if if you put in your will that you leave the house, it's all it's it's likely that. He get put on title and then probably sell the house to take the money and go overseas. Whatever capital gains tax there might be on that, um, it, 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 it's another thing. But as far as you can you can leave your property somewhere whether they live overseas or not, there just might be um, tax consequences or duty yeah, consequences. Yeah. 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 But if he's now, now if he's leaving you and Canada. I don't think it's like you. Just <laughs> <laughs> and if, and if, it is valid. If any of you have assets that are held overseas, they may be subject to overseas money laws. Yes. Okay. One of our clients, very sadly, was left a whole stack of Hong Kong Shanghai bank shares, which listed on the London Stock Exchange, by his mother. Sadly, well, his mother hasn't lived in the UK ever, as far as I know, and he only visits. On holiday, but the Hong Kong Bank shares are listed on the London Stock Exchange. The several million dollars of her estate was subject to the UK estate duty, which had to be settled before he was allowed to take delivery of those shares. So he couldn't sell the shares to pay the duty. So he had to borrow the money. Guess what? He's not resident in the UK, so nobody in the UK was prepared to lend him the money to pay the estate duty. So, and so it goes on. Yeah. If you've got shares of Rio, which trade in London, New York, and here, no offense. If the ones you own are listed here, not a problem. Right. Okay. Hong Kong bank shares aren't listed here, they're yeah. listed in New York and London. The ones she held were London listed, subject to the UK tax law. But the same does apply here, by the way, if there are stamp duty consequences to anything, if you hold assets that are actually registered in New South Wales. New South Wales have stamp duty on managed funds? Yes. Managed funds in New South Wales. That's why you find that a number of managed funds are actually registered in the ACT because they don't have standard duty. 
or managed by the set. You know, they, they, that's when I said that there are different rules for all of these different states and territories I meant to, and it goes down to that further detail when you're wrapping up these states. It's a real nuisance. It's a fun game. Why did I have that deduction from the seven? Excuse me, Jeff, can you excuse this? We've sure. got family down from the states and stuff. I was going to say, you want to make sure he hasn't ever got the policy. I'm sure he'll have the policy. 